blue pill or the red pill. We have to wake up out of the matrix of conditioning that we are living in within ourselves and in society and in life. We're afraid of what will people think? Well, what happened to our true nature? We're afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of, you know, people not liking us. We develop a role, a mask, a persona, and we contort ourselves into a certain shape to become who we think we need to be in order to get love, validation, and approval. Hugh Flaxon is a visionary and a leading light in the field of personal development renowned for his unparalleled ability to inspire profound transformation. His global background and intuitive approach have positioned him as a unique force in empowering individuals to unlock their true potential and embark on a life of freedom, purpose, and authenticity. Through his compelling books, dynamic workshops, and powerful speeches, Cute ignites the path for self-discovery and radical change, making him a true catalyst for worldwide awakening. I said a thousand positive reaffirmations to my child all day long, but now she's a teenager and she, she's depressed, she's X, Y, and Z. Our children will often express and act out the unresolved issues of their parents. I think if I would see our episode before I had my two kids, I would never have kids. <laughs> my son, your daughter. But the truth is, they belong to you, but they don't belong to you. They belong to life, they belong to the universe. They're yours, but they're not yours. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Good. Uh, why should people who are watching or listening to us right now should stop what they are doing and listen to you? Um, I don't think people should do anything. I think people should follow the soul and trust what they feel. What, 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 what was the biggest message you would like to deliver to our audience or in general that you are delivering today? Um, uh, the biggest message, I don't know if there's one, but what I really feel as though is there's a power inside of us, a power inside of us all, that we are infinite beings. And as infinite beings, we've often forgotten how powerful we really are because of our conditioning. And so really what I help people do, what I help people remember is who they really are. And I think when we remember who we really are and what we really are, uh, it changes the whole perspective and relationship to life. You know, to me, life is a game. When you say remember, what do you mean by that? We forget what, who we are? I think many times we do forget who we are, don't we? We, we think we're just this limited mind-body mechanism. We think we're just this body. We think we're just this ego. That we are born, then we die, and, and we're brainwashed and conditioned by society, by schools, by education, by teachers, by media, by social media, by news. Uh, often that the purpose of life is to go to school, get a degree, get a job, make some money, go on vacation, buy two cars, pump out two babies, retire, and then die. And for me, it's like, is this what life is? Like, is this the purpose of life? That's it? Then we die and that's it. And so for me, that's been a lifelong question from a very young age. What's the purpose of life? Why are we here? Why do we incarnate into this human experience? And, and so I think that <clears throat> when we incarnate into this human experience called life, we are all in touch 
with our infinite nature. You look at a child. A child is in touch with their infinite nature. A baby, when they're born, before their condition, they're in touch with their, 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 I mean, call it divinity, call it infinity. You look into a child's eyes. I have not met one child that I didn't see some spark of something before they were conditioned, right? You look into a baby's eyes and you see light inside of every child. There is light. I don't care if it's Pablo Escobar when he was two months old, Hitler when he was two months old, Mother Teresa when he was two months old. I don't care. Like every child has a light. I look into my six months old, my, my nine, now nine month old baby's, baby boy's eyes and it's just, I see God shining through. They're in touch. Mm. We were all in touch with that at some point. And as little babies, we're fearless, man. My little son will reach out to a, to a hot stove. He doesn't care. He's not afraid. Nobody has told him and conditioned him that, oh, that's dangerous. Uh, he'll just like jump off a bed. Nobody, that he has no fear. But slowly through the process mm. of life, we get conditioned. So the way I see it is we are all these bright beings, infinite in nature. We're in, We've just come from the other side, incarnated into this human experience, and we are full of light. But the thing is, now we meet our parents, and God bless them. We all have interesting parents, don't we? I mean, they all meant well, but now we meet our parents, right? Some, some of our parents are crazy, and we meet our parents, and they're just doing the best that they know how to do based on their childhood and their upbringing and their pain and their traumas and their you know childhood traumas. And so... We are all born into a generational pattern of preset conditioning. Maybe dad is crazy. Maybe mom is an alcoholic. Maybe they're fighting all the time. And, and, and maybe dad has left. Maybe mom has left. Maybe there's divorce. Maybe there's abuse. Maybe there's dysfunction. And so two things happen. As children, we would jump on the table and sing. We didn't care. We would run naked through the house. We didn't care. We were free. So what happened to us? By the time we're 25 and 35 and 45, though, we're so afraid of expressing ourselves. We're afraid of what will people think? Well, what happened to our true nature? We're afraid of being rejected. Or we're afraid of, you know, people not liking us. And so we hide parts of ourselves in order to get love, validation and approval. We don't express our voice. We're afraid if you really know who I am, then maybe you won't love me. And so what happened to us as these free beings? So we incarnate to this human experience. <clears throat> Two things happen. The first thing is, as children, maybe our environment, maybe our parents were, were good people, but they just didn't know how to meet our emotional needs. And that was painful. So the first thing that happens is, happens is we learn all sorts of strategies to shut down, disconnect, and not feel. Oh, it's too painful to feel like dad is, has left. Dad has left me. Mom and dad are fighting all the time. There's so much instability. And so we shut down, disconnect, not feel. We suppress, suppress, suppress so many layers of feelings as a emotional strategy to function, survive, and not feel the chaos, not feel the abandonment, not feel how painful it is or how helpless it feels to not have our needs met. And so now we close our hearts, disconnect, shut down. Before you know it, layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of unprocessed, unfelt feeling starts to cover up our true light. And our true light is hidden under these layers of suppressed emotion. And then before you know it, now we become, now we go into the world and we start, often it's unconscious, the conditioning process is unconscious, where we start thinking, well, who do I need to be in order for mom to love me? Or if I get all A's, mm. if, I, if I'm nice, if I'm sweet, if I'm kind, if I'm, if I'm filling the blank, if I'm this way, because we start learning from a very young age, often unintentionally that love is conditional. When I'm a certain way, then I get love from mom or the teacher or the religion or school or the church. And so we develop a role, a mask, a persona, and we contort ourselves into a certain shape to become who we think we need to be in order to get love, validation and approval. We become nice. We become sweet. We become the one that knows it all, the one that is independent, the one that takes care of everyone. We become the one that fixes everybody's problems because... You know, life was so, and our family system was so chaotic because now we think if I can fix everyone's problems, then I'm going to get love and validation. So we become a version of ourselves to avoid pain, to get love. We contort into a shape and we hold on to this way of being as a strategy of survival. The challenge is the version of ourselves that we've learned to, we've become conditioned to become is not who we really are. 
it's just what mm. we think ourselves to be. And this is where many times we end up saying, maybe you've said this, like, oh, I'm just this way. It's just, you know, you're in a relationship and someone says, well, why are you this? I'm just, it's just who I am. I'm just, I'm just shy. I'm just, but the thing is, we don't realize that the version of ourselves that we've become is not who we really are often. It's just conditioned patterns to, in response to things that happen. And so the degree to which we are conditioned and the degree to which we hold tight to our conditioning is the degree to which we are not free and the degree to which we don't have free will. We're just being run by the conditioning of our past. And most of us are going through life because we're not aware. Most of us are going through life conditioned, not aware that we're conditioned. And as a result, we're living on autopilot. And so we're not in touch with our infinite nature. We're not in touch with our true essence. We're not in touch with our soul, our, our true power. We're in touch with our limitation. And, and that's how we live. And so you look at much of society is unhappy. You know? And I think much of society, mm -hmm. advertising, media, religions, have an investment in you and I and all of us not knowing who we really are. Because the more disconnected we are from our true power, our true nature, the more we live in fear, the more we can be controlled and manipulated by the media. We're, we're constantly being brainwashed and taught. You're not enough. I mean, how often do we right. see on the All news, the right? On the news, switch on, right. switch on the news, Fox News, CNN. You're amazing. You're incredible. You're powerful. There's, there's potential inside of you. No, what do we hear? Uh, you're not enough. But if you just like wear this underwear, you're going to be really lovable. You know, you're not, you're not lovable. But if you just like buy this car, like this car is going to make you lovable. And so now we get brainwashed into believing that we're not enough. Oh, I'm just this limited little body and I'm just by circumstance. And so the more we buy into that, the more we're controlled. And so there is a kind of a, I don't say a conspiracy, that's a strong word, but a sort of media conspiracy in you and I not knowing who we are, because when we don't know who we are, we don't know our true power. And as a result, we can be manipulated and controlled. And it's easy to keep us kind of controlled. And so I think that for me, to remind people that, hey, we are infinite. We are infinite. There is a power inside of us. But in order to do that, we have to, we have to become aware that we're conditioned. We have to wake up. You know, the, the movie, The Matrix, right? The blue pill or the red pill. We have to wake up out of the matrix of conditioning that we are living in within ourselves and in society and in life and begin to question ourselves. And it can be a bit scary to question ourselves when what the very self that we think we are is all that we've known. So it takes courage. So what I help people do is I help people wake up to who they are. I help people question. <clears throat> and I create processes that you could say, guide people step by step to that process. Mm. Anyway. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. I'd love to ask a question because uh, while you were talking, and thank you for sharing that. But, so you mentioned you have a nine month old son. Yes, I love my son. <laughs> yeah, I have a daughter who is now five months. Oh, wow, congrats. I, of course, love my daughter so much. Thank you so much. It's the best thing that happened yes, to me in my life. Yes. But going back, I, I totally agree with you. When I look her, into her eyes, it's all it is, it's light, pure, light, pure, pure joy. Love. It's infinite, infinite possibilities. So here's my question, and I'm sure perhaps it's complex and there's many different mm. things that, that, but how do I, how do I prevent or how do I, what should I do in my parenting Beautiful style? Question. Maybe it's one action because there's no way I'm going to be able to follow your 50 steps today. Yeah. But for those who are watching who might have a newborn, maybe a toddler, yes. maybe even a, a teenager, What's something that I need to be aware of right now? Okay. Sorry, let me add one more thing. Uh, I like that you touch the unconditional love. I think this is one of the most important steps. Also, could you please touch this uh, aspect yes. as well? You know, I love the question that you're both asking. This is kind of really cool. Now, I think there's a tendency to give like 
the 18 steps to parenting and strategies and technique, 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 technique. But the thing is, what might work for one child won't work for another child because every child is unique. Every child has a unique... Right. I think every child is a unique soul and every child has a unique destiny a, and unique life lessons that they are here to learn. And so in that sense, I don't think a blanket technique will work for every child because every child has their own unique unfolding, their own unique needs. And so with that said, for parents, what I would love parents to know, just to set a context for your question, is <clears throat> as parents, I think parenting is perhaps the most profound spiritual path and practice that there is. It is a Parenting is a spiritual path of evolution and surrender in and of itself. Because you have to realize that the soul has come through you, right? <clears throat> As your child, my son, your daughter. But the truth is, they belong to you, but they don't belong to you. They belong to life. They belong to the universe. They're yours, but they're not yours. Because this soul right. has, she has her own journey and their own lessons, whether you like it or not. And on some level, they're going to learn the lessons. So part of the art of parenting becomes, how do you guide your child? right and protect them without imposing your own conditioning onto them right then right. they become another conditioned version and so on a deeper level versus just giving a sort of outside in seven steps and, and techniques is i think for every parent one of the most powerful things that we can do and you can do as a parent is to do your own mental emotional spiritual psychological healing because the more pain, hurt, trauma, unresolved shit you're carrying from your own childhood, <clears throat> that will filter and project onto your child things that you didn't get enough of and you didn't feel enough of and angers and resentments that you're carrying. And now you're going to project that onto your child. And that will, that will inform how you show up and relate and condition your child, right? So that's, mm. that's the first thing. So I think the more you can heal yourself, and do your inner work, that also provides a, uh, uh, the possibility where you're, you're not going to impose your fears onto your child. That's the first mm. thing. But that will enable you to show up for them more <clears throat> freely. Second thing that's still connected is, I really feel that our children often reflect and our children will often act out because we are so psychologically, emotionally, mentally, energetically connected to our children. Our children will often express and act out the unresolved issues of their parents. And so mm. with that said, secrets, pain, wounds, shame, hurt, patterns, you know, dysfunctions, Whatever isn't resolved that is passed down from our grandparents and our great grandparents, that that is that energy is passed down to us. And the whatever is unresolved that we don't resolve, that energy is also passed down to our children. And so I think one of the greatest gifts as parents we can give our children is as we do our own inner healing on a mental, emotional, spiritual, therapeutic level, we clear our consciousness. Now, this is a spiritual thing, but we clear our consciousness. As we clear and heal our consciousness, we become cleaner, we become clearer, we become more elevated. Then I think that will, that will, that will then mean less unresolved patterns will need to sort of transfer, flow to our children. Then they can have the clearer soil in order mm. to grow. And I think one of the greatest gifts we can give our children for the next generation is the clear consciousness and the space and the soil <clears throat> so that the seed <clears throat> of their soul can grow and evolve. One of the greatest things I think we can give our children, glad you mentioned, is unconditional love. To me, beyond mm. technique, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Because the truth is, we're never going to be a perfect parent. You know, we're going to screw up. We're going to mess right. up. We're going to get upset. We're going to get stressed. You know, we could, we're not robots. We're human beings. But I think that, that no matter what, the greatest gift we can give our, pet, our children is unconditional love. But it's hard to love your kids unconditionally 
if you're being very conditional with yourself. And that's why your mm. own inner healing is key. And so the more you can begin to have grace and compassion and unconditionality with your own self and your own process, the more you're going to be able to give that to your kids. The, the expanded, you're going to be able to expand that to your children. So when we can love our children unconditionally, part of that is I love you unconditionally, no matter what you do, no matter your behavior, no matter what grades you get in school or don't get, that takes away nothing from who you are. That provides the mm. base I think of nutrition and, and, and mental, emotional, psychological, psychic, energetic health for our kids to grow in. That gives them the real mm -hmm. foundation of self-esteem because then they no longer have to be like, well, if I get all A's, dad's going to love me more. If I get, right. if I, if I, if I become, uh, if I, if I qualify for the football team, then that's going to love me more. If I do this, it's, it's not, there's no if and or. It's, there's just I love you unconditionally no matter what you do or no matter what you don't do. I think that allows your children's psyche and nervous system to just relax. Then that, that mm. infuses them with a deep, invisible self-worth, you know, and inner strength. Regardless of what you say or don't say, it's it's a sort of a invisible cushion that they can relax in where they don't have to be right. constantly seeking from the world to get what they didn't get with you and I as parents. The third thing connected to that, which is connected to unconditional love, connected to what Vlad said, is one of the greatest gifts I think you, we, can give our children is, as you said, when you look at your daughter, She's pure essence. Our children incarnate into a world <clears throat> that it, this is like the matrix, where the world is seeing is not seeing their divinity. The world sees their grades. Mm. The world judges them based on their religion, based on how they look, based on their size, based on their gender, based on their color, based on their behaviors. And they're going into a world that doesn't see their true essence. And there's something inside mm. of children that are very young that they are still very connected to that divine part of them. Now they're born into the world that doesn't see that divine part of them. I think it kind of makes kids grow a bit crazy. Like, wait a second, I know I'm divine, but the world doesn't see me as divine. It, it creates an internal angst. So the mm. greatest gift that we can give our kids as a parent, as teachers, as caregivers, is to see their true essence. When you can mm. really focus on seeing the essence and, and, and through your seeing, it's not just what you say, but it's how you see them. Many times we see their behaviors. We see how difficult they are. We see how not X, Y, Z they are. But when you can see through that into their soul and see their essence and, and reflect that back to them, what happens is when your children see you seeing them, what we are reflecting back to them is the truth of who they are and that seeing of who they are acts as a invisible mirror that reminds them of who they are in a world that is reminding them of who they're not. And I think that's such a profound gift. It's like, I see you. I see who you are. Not even through words. It's just, I see you. I see your wholeness. I see your beauty. I see your perfection. And sometimes as your kids, as our kids grow up, they're going to forget that in the world as, as the human, as, in the human experience, mm -hmm. right? But when we see them and they relate to us, we remind them that that, I think, keeps that divinity and that, that infinity and that power in them alive as a seed that can just grow. Hmm. You see, it, it, it's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's easy to say, maybe it's easy uh -huh. to do for parents, but it's so hard. For example, I'm doing my job well, yes, for kids. I'm giving her in unconditional love, all this. And then when she goes to school or she goes to whatever cop, if I'm if I'm homeschool and then teachers comes in and teacher can tell yes. her, OK, you are not enough. You are this. You are that. You are not qualifying. So how to deal with uh, this kind of things? Because it's not only on parents, it's on teachers, on. on yeah, parents. I, I, I think I think that as parents, the more you can instill that in them, then then hopefully what you instill inside of them will be stronger and more than whatever a teacher can say. That's one. Hmm. That, that, that foundation of knowing and you instilling like, 
see you, the perfection, your being, you know, it's infused in your culture at home and the, the osmosis, that's one. But also, right, it's one thing to tell your kids, you're enough, you're valuable, you're worthy. But as parents, your kids don't just listen to what you say, they pick up through osmosis who you're being. They pick up your, you as the parents, your state of consciousness. So you as a parent, me as a parent, if I feel shit about myself, if I don't value myself, if, I, if I'm not really feeling worthy inside of myself, no matter what I tell them, you're enough, you're beautiful, you're amazing, they're going to pick up on how I feel. Because especially right. when they're very young, kids' nervous system is regulated by the parent, mostly probably by the mother but by the parent, right? And so, and so we have to be the example within ourselves so that our kids can pick that up. And so I think creating that environment at home within ourselves and in the space and in the environment where that is affirmed, because the truth is when they go into school, it, it's gonna, it, it will be affected. Now, unless you can choose an environment or a school, this is why I think a school environment is very important because the school environment will have an effect on the child. So if you as a teacher, as a, par as a parent, are able to be intentional on where you send your school and discerning on who is teaching and conditioning your child, I think this is such that, an that's, important That's so thing. hard to, to manage. It's so, look, <laughs> it's, it's so hard to manage. And, and it's not possible to manage every aspect of right. your child's life. And I think as parents, we have to realize that our children in some way are going to get conditioned. It's impossible that they won't get conditioned. Our children will get conditioned in some way. But if we can at least provide the soil, the soil right. that is so rich with nutrients and water that soil every day through how we speak, to how we are, to how we interact with each other as, you know, parents and husband and wife and, you know, spouses together and the environment and the grandparents and the close community. That watering of the soil provides the nutrients for the seed of the child to grow. Like, I look at my life. My mother, Japanese woman, beautiful soul, far from a perfect, you know, person. My father wasn't around a lot. My father had his own, you know, was a great man, but had his own issues. So I grew up kind of without a father, even though he was there. Um, they had their own issues because my father's from Ghana. My mother's Japanese. Crazy cultural differences, right? A lot of yeah. a lot of emotional issues between them. But I knew, I knew what kept me sane. Okay, what kept me sane in school, in work, and I left home at eighteen. I left London. I came to the U.S. at 18 with two suitcases, $800 in my pocket, knowing no one left home. What kept me sane was deep down, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, a doubt, I was loved by my mother. She loved me hmm. unconditionally. And despite the challenges of my life and my childhood, there was this deep knowing of how loved I was by her. And I can't tell you that that foundation was the soil that I grew in. And that's what kept me sane. So I think if we as parents can provide that, that's the magic. But what we have to realize is no matter what we do, our children will have their own karma. Our children will have their own issues. Our children will have their own patterns, problems, pain, and conditioning. Even if Jesus had a kid, I think his kid would have his own issues. Maybe his kid would be in therapy going, right. damn it, man, my dad is doing all these miracles. My dad is Jesus. The only, uh, he would have his own stuff. So I don't think there's a right. way to avoid that in the human experience. So I think as parents, when we can remember that our kids are souls, and as souls, we incarnate into the human experience. The human experience is like a university for our souls. We incarnate in order to learn, to grow, to evolve. And so our kids, just like us, they have their own life lessons in this human experience that they're going to learn. The, the best we can do, we may not be able to prevent our kids from learning the lessons, but what we can do is equip our kids with the psychology, the emotional, unconditional love 
some of the tools to be able to go through the storm and the lessons that they're going to go through in the game of life to be able to go through it with some grace, some understanding, some resilience. So what I'm hearing is this work really starts with yourself. That's the foundation. If you're thinking about your kid, go and clean your shit before even doing The, the best right. thing that you can right. do as a parent right. is to clear your own shit. Yep. Now, I would just right. say before you say something, right? You're both saying something so cool. Like, I was joking with someone, but but I think I think the best thing we can do, like if you really want to be a parent, before you even have a kid, deal with your shit. And then whilst the kid is in the mother's belly, the mother's womb, because I think there is a communication that the kid is a living, breathing being growing in the mother's womb is picking up on so much. And so even the pre-birth to be able to infuse love and prayers and healing and compassion and the mother being in a good state, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, is imprinting the nervous system of the child. I think this is super, super important. What I would, so that's, that's the other thing I think we can do as parents, right? What I would love to see, and this is kind of a joke, but a side note, but, but, I, but I love what the work that you, you, you're all doing. I was joking with someone the other day. I'm like, there should be, every government should have like a parent university <laughs> where if you want to have children, you got to go to the, you know, parent, you know, parent department, like the DMV, yeah. you know, the parent, parent department, get a license to have a child. This license is valid for three years. You take a test, number one, to understand the psychological, emotional development of, of, of childhood psychology but then you also have to do your own mental emotional healing through therapy and inner work so that you can kind of deal with your own stuff understand your child then you get the license to have a kid and then you can try and have a kid anyway that's that's a then we would suffer with population (laughs) (laughs) yeah right let's see how many people actually pass and have a kid right right But no, I mean, while it may be a joke, I, I do comp- I do agree with you. I mean, I wish it was that way. Actually, I, I mean, I, I I I do feel like that that should be the way. But of course, that would never happen. But I, I do want to re-highlight actually something that you mentioned, which just in case listeners miss, I want to reiterate. When you tell your child, because a lot of us may be saying, "Hey, to my child, hey, you're beautiful, you're perfect." you you can do anything you want Mm. a lot of parents see failures because of what you just mentioned which is they may be saying you're beautiful but the parent does not feel beautiful themselves and the kids see that and i want i want to reiterate that because yes and so so a lot of parents might say hey well i you know i i said a thousand positive reaffirmations to my child all day long but now she's a teenager and she she's depressed she's x y and z well that may be because Whatever words you were saying, did you actually feel that to be true? You're telling your child she's beautiful, she's fearless. Are you fearless? Yes, Are you yes, brave? Yes, Are you courageous? Yes. And so I think that's a, I think that's very very important because it's easy to say those words of affirmation. But again, I think I think that central theme goes back to you really have to do the work on yourself. I think I think <laughs> so if I would see I, our I, episode before I had my two kids, I would never have kids. <laughs> <laughs> So much preparation, it's crazy. I mean But but you think about it, right? We are we are raising these humans. Like when I, when, when you see your, your your daughter, right, five months, but we're raising life. It's a human. We were all we were all like this once, pure and innocent, and then we grow up and become a killer. Then we grow up and become Donald Trump. We grow up and become Biden. We grow up and become, you know, uh whoever, like 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 you know, Putin or or a mayor or it's just like, wait a second. We were all this pure little innocent beings. And so, and so it's a responsibility being a parent. I think being a parent is the most important job in the world because we are raising, we are raising a universe. We are raising a soul. We are raising a being that's going to go out into the world and can impact the world and can transform the world, can destroy the world. And so I think somehow in our culture, we've taken it a bit lightly. We just you know, pop out a kid and, you know, 
we abandon the kid, we're not there for the kid, we are there for the kid, we beat the kid, we avoid the kid, we, you know, we all doing our best, the best we can. But when you really think about what being a parent is, and that's why I said it is a spiritual path, it is a sacred responsibility to care for the soul. When we think about that, it's, 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 it's profound that this soul yeah. somehow, yeah. I don't want to say chose you, but this soul kind of, you know, came through you it chose you it's 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 wow it's it's mind blowing you know and i think for any teacher okay you may not be the parent of this child but now as a teacher if you really feel the sacred responsibility that you have to affect the consciousness and raise this child if any teacher would really sit with and meditate on what that is, you have the ability to affect this child's evolution for the rest of their life and maybe lifetimes and maybe eternity. Whoa, that's, you're not just, I'm just a teacher. It's like you are, that is huge and not to be taken lightly, you know, at all. You know, it's, at least it's a, it's a good thing if uh, parents or teachers will do a bad job that we as humans, we can adapt and change. So meaning if we did a bad job, we can fix it. Yes. We can go dig our shit out, clean it up. Yes, it will be harder, but at least it's fixable. Yes. You know, it's not it's like, fixable. okay, we as parents, we <laughs> but did a bad job. That's it. It's uh, the, for the rest of their lives, our kids going to be stuck. stuck yeah. Well, I, I want to talk briefly about this topic over here. So, I, I, I know you have a your, your book, which is called the well, your your the latest book, which is the Magic of Surrender: Finding the Courage to Let Go. And you you often explore the idea that true liberation comes from surrendering control and allowing the universe to work its magic through mm -hmm. us. So, I know we got we're, we're talking a little bit more about that, but what is an actionable step? But let's say, for example, let's just take me, for example, that I can take, you know, so I'm somebody who is very meticulous. I plan, you know, uh, uh, everything. I, I'm, I'm trying to understand how do I what's that first step of surrender, sur surrendering control yeah. in my life? Because I like to control almost everything. every aspect of it and I, I <laughs> almost everything except because, and because I, I did watch. And, then, and, and, and yes, there's a time and, for that. Right. So let's right. be, so let me ask you, you've obviously had sex. Correct. You've both made love. Was it a beautiful experience? I, you better say yes. Right? <laughs> it's beautiful. Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> I hope so. Right. Of you course. made love with your yes. wife, with your girlfriend, with, 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 with the love of right. your life. Now it was ecstatic, hopefully. And if you think of your lovemaking experience, both of you think of your lovemaking, it was, oh, yeah, that was beautiful. Did you, and yet, did you go to your lovemaking experience, right? With a notepad. Okay, I have meticulously, <laughs> honey, um, we're going to make love today at exactly 7.45. And I have the entire schedule of the two hour and 11 minute lovemaking experience. The first move we're gonna do at minute one, honey, is you're gonna kiss me this way, and then I'm gonna do this, then you're gonna turn around. And was that how it was? Hell no. Uh, no, no, of course not. No, so, right. so, so what made it so blissful was you didn't know. What made it so blissful was you were feeling your connection to your lover and, and your wife and your woman, and, and you were just feeling the connection and you were just in the flow. You were surrendered, right? And in that right, surrender, right. you were open. You didn't know what was going to happen the next minute, the next second. You didn't know what you wasn't planned. And, and because you surrendered and let go, it was beautiful. Imagine you, ha you had your entire lovemaking scripted for the next 40 years of your life. You would right. be celibate. It would be so miserable. Right. And so this right. is the power of surrender just to make it visceral. Like, what if we live that mm. way where you're feeling and you're connecting and you're present and you're open and you're in the moment and you're allowing the moment between you and your lover, between you and life to show you to lead you. And so there's this misconception, just to set a context, and I'll tell you maybe what you can do. There's a misconception in our culture that surrender is weak, that surrender is giving right. up, 
that surrender is passive. That surrender means chaos. That surrender means you sit there and do nothing. That surrender means uh, you won't manifest your goals, dreams, and desires. That surrender means you're going to get less in life. And I'm actually saying, no, if you understand true surrender, what if you didn't get less in life? But what if you actually got more? More than you could have planned. More than you could have even expected with the limita limitation of your planning mind. Maybe not what you expected, mm. but what if it was better? And so I believe that surrender is the most powerful thing that you can do. Surrender is mm. the real secret to manifestation. Surrender is the real password to freedom. Surrender is the real key to magic. If you want more magic, you got to surrender. Like, like sex is magical when you let go and you surrender, not because you control everything. And so right. surrender is, just to clarify, it is a letting go of control. It is. It is a letting go of control, or at least the illusion that we're in control. It, it, control is a master addiction. Surrender is when you stop trying to force and manipulate life to fit your limited idea of what you think it should be. It's when you let go mm. of the idea of how you think life should be and how you think you should be so that you can take the limitations off of life and be open and be available. And so the old paradigm of how we're conditioned by society and life, even in spiritual personal growth books, is you got to know what you want. You've got to get clear on what you want. You've got to plan what you want, plan everything, plan everything. And then you go for it and you make it happen and you control everything and you make it happen. Now, I'm not saying this is the ego-based model for living life. You can create this way. You can. But it will always be limited. Because whatever you create from mm. the ego will be limited because the ego is right. still conditioned by the past. It's like Mandela. Mandela could never have sat down and said, well, let me set some goals. I'm going to spend 27 years in prison. I'm going to come out of prison and then become the, right, it, right. it's like you can't plan a Mandela. That's the magic. Right. You can plan A, B, C, but you can't plan in like infinite possibilities. And so right. the old paradigm is what do you want? And sometimes you might get what you thought you wanted only to realize that what you thought you wanted mm. was only what you thought you wanted based on who you thought you were. But if you weren't in touch with right. who you really were, many times your goals will be projections of unmet needs. And so what I would invite you, what, what, what I'm inviting people to ask is not simply, what do I want? It's okay to ask, but don't get attached. Ask this question. What is it that life is seeking to express through me? What is it that life is seeking to create through me? What is my soul seeking to manifest? What is it that, that the universe is seeking to express through me? What is the deepest, the deepest truth and impulse that, that is seeking to express, express through me and feel that, to be able to be still and feel that and be honest about that and catch the vision for what that is? It may not always be what you think it is, but I promise you mm. it will be what is most true. The Magic of Surrender book that I wrote that's become a bestseller was not the book I wanted to write. It was the book I tried not to write, to be honest. But I knew when I became still and I felt the truth of my being, this was the book that was seeking to be written. This was the book I was mm. meant to write. The book had a soul of its own. And it, when I became still and I let go, I felt this is what was coming through. So when you can catch the vision of what is true, not just what you think you should be or the person you think you should be married to, but this is what's true. Then you can align with that. Then, then you can align your personality. Then you can bring in your planning and your strategy and your, and your focus and your disciplines and your marketing mm. to support the fulfillment of what is authentic and true versus what you think should be. Then you go 100%, then you give 100%, then you go into action without attaching to the outcome. That's the difference. Hmm. Also as a parents and as a teachers, I guess, I mean, th these people are the best to realize that plans are not working out all the time, especially with kids. Yeah, you, <laughs> you can plan your day. You okay, go. I'm going to wake up. <laughs> I'm going to do the breakfast. I'm going to go to gym, this and that. And here you go. Today I'm waking up. She is sick. And that's it. All plan is ruined. Wrong. Most of the, most of the that's, people that's why go. I, yeah. That's I why go. I said parenting is the ultimate spiritual path. Mm. It's because you're, you're not. I mean, 
Yeah, I'm not saying, right. okay, let's just let everything go to hell. That's not surrender. It's yes, Vlad's saying, you have your plan. Okay, we're going to do this, going to have breakfast. But now that your child is sick, what do you do? No, 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 no. I have my plan. I'm sorry. Yeah, you stay exactly. sick in the corner. It, you have to, you have to right. surrender and, and allow life to lead you, allow life to guide mm. you. That doesn't mean you still don't get your plan done. But maybe you need to move your plan and flow with life and handle your child now and and then work out later on. And then as you deal with your child now, but here's the thing, maybe you, you're spending time with your child now and you, you take her to the park and then you take her to the hospital on your way back from the hospital. Maybe you bump into the exact person you needed to meet. And, and so it's a way of living that you move forward, but you don't mm. attach so rigidly to your plan and your ideas, you're allowing life to lead you. And so what that requires is a curiosity because as parents, right. you can have your plans, but your kids, you don't control your, I mean, you don't control when your kids poop. You don't control when your kids right. sleep. You don't control when your kid cries or not. They just, it's out of your control. To me. You, you, th you think that you're controlling, but in reality you are not because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what we can control is our response. But so much right. of it is out of our control. It's like life. We think we're in control, but then COVID hits. And then, you know, all our plans go to shit, right? It's like going to the ocean. You don't, you don't control the ocean. The best big right. wave surfers, Laird Hamilton, Kelly Slater, they don't go to the ocean with a fire hose and try to make the wave, but they go to the ocean and they feel for the wave. And the, they can't control the waves, but they can control how they surf the wave. And there's the difference. And that is surrender, mm. right? You're not trying to make a wave into a wave that isn't a wave. And you're not fighting right. the waves that are happening. Like there shouldn't be a wave, but there is a wave. And you're right. learning how to work with nature, work with the flow, and surf the waves that are happening in life. No, mm. I also wanted to add to our... So one first rule for parenting is to give unconditional love, as we discussed. And the second one I would add is to teach them uh, to embrace failures. So nice. embrace failures with the planning, with everything. Because, I mean, I see in my in my kids, if plan is ruined, I mean, that's it. They will be crying <laughs> all day long. Okay, we, it's ruined. Yeah. We cannot do this, that. So I'm trying to teach them that fail it's and easy. embrace the suck, embrace the suck and surrender, as you said. This is, I think, one of the most powerful yeah. lessons that they can learn from us as parents. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to go ahead and uh, we have one uh, question, one more question sure. here on my end for you, which is, uh, I know we were talking a lot earlier about truths. So speaking of truths, is it beneficial to share truths that we discover uh, even if the truths might not be welcomed or understood? Should we always express the truth even if we may or we may want to not express it? We may want to lie about it. To ourselves or to somebody I, else? Yes. To somebody else, not ourselves, because that I would, that I would assume. Yeah, that... it depends what the context is. Like you can go up to someone and just say, hey, you're fat. Or, you know, you're this or you're that. And I don't know if that right. really serves anything. Right? right. I don't know if that right. serves. I mean, it's, you could say it's subjective. It's your truth. It's not necessarily the truth. Right. But I do think right. one of the things that keeps us stuck within our own spiritual evolution, within our own growth, are all the ways that we lie to ourselves. And as human beings, in many ways, because of, the ways we've been conditioned that I shared earlier, we've learned to lie to ourselves about how we feel. No, I'm fine. I don't need anybody. I'm good. I'm great. Mm. I got this. I'm independent. When maybe it was really painful to not have needs met. And because that was painful, we just now have convinced ourselves, I don't need anyone. And so that's a lie. So is there benefit to acknowledge the truth of like, wow, that hurt. And I do need help. Yeah. Because you can't really reach out and receive, allow yourself to receive help unless you acknowledge the truth, right? We've learned mm, to betray right. our truth as children because, oh, 
when I'm nice, that he loves me. So let me be nice, even though I don't feel good inside. So we've learned to betray right. parts of ourselves, developing a role and a mask and a persona. So this is, again, another way that we've learned to lie about who we are and what, what we are, not intentionally, often unconsciously. And so right. I think that on an inner level, then we'll deal with the outer level. On the inner level, there is no transformation without truth. The truth will set you free. So I would invite everyone to sit with the question, what lies am I telling myself? What lies am I telling myself? What am I pretending to not know? We stay in relationships that we know are not right. We work jobs that we hate. We betray ourselves saying yes when we mean no. And I'll tell everyone, take the pressure off of yourself from having to take any action because sometimes the fear of the consequence of the action of telling the truth is what disconnects us it kind of triggers an internal self-protective mechanism to disconnect us from acknowledging our truth. So if we can just start with, I hate my job, I don't have to leave my job, but let me just, let me just, right. let me just tell the truth. I hate my job. I'm not in love with my wife. It's scary. You don't have to leave nothing to do, but just feel that that begins a process inside. I have an alcohol problem, mm -hmm. no judgment, just acknowledge the truth. When you acknowledge the truth, that starts an inner process, an inner movement of feeling what's underneath that. That's a beginning. So I would just invite people, start with telling yourself the truth. You can't change something until you acknowledge where you're at. So that's just level one with yourself. Or I would say always tell the truth to yourself because that's, that's the beginning of freedom. When we don't, hmm. it is painful. And how you know that you're lying to yourself is you will feel some level of emotional pain, depression, frustration, resentment, anger, lack of aliveness, physical pain, backache, shoulder ache, it will often manifest ongoing disease, right? This is, again, your subconscious manifesting through your body. And, and so pain is simply feedback that you're not living in alignment with the truth of your own being mm. in some way. Now, in relationship, I think it depends what level of relationship you are with someone, right? If it's someone that you never see, right. it may not right. really serve to say, hey, hey, Joe, I right. never see you. I see you every five years. Let me bear my truth to you and tell you how it, right. it may not serve anything at right. work. Right. It may not always serve anything, but let's just say in an intimate relationship, you have an affair, you're cheating, you're feeling you know, resentful about X, Y, Z. The truth always serves growth and i believe mm. that withholds especially in in intimate closer relationships withholds block the flow of intimacy connection and love always always and mm. so in that sense i'm a big proponent of truth it depends what level you want to play at and what level you want to play the game of intimacy connection and relationship with you know and so I found many times when you share the truth and the truth might be, I'm feeling insecure. The truth might be, I'm not feeling connected. I'm not feeling, you know, that can lead to a deeper exploration. It doesn't have to be something's wrong, but it can lead to a deeper exploration right. to explore what's underneath that so that you can maybe unravel the problem so that you can move through that. And so, yes, I believe that the truth serves everyone even if it doesn't always seem that way at first, because when you speak your truth with love, with compassion, with vulnerability, it will often force someone else to look at something within themselves mm -hmm. that if you both have an understanding in relationship of the real purpose of relationship, which is about growth and evolution, then by you speaking your truth might trigger something for someone else that you can both look at right. that and go to a deeper level. And there's that potential. By not speaking mm. your truth, you can often rob someone of also of their own growth and evolution. And now, and now imagine Great how, response. Yeah. how, uh, how to say it, how gentle this game is because you are dealing with not only with yourself right now, but with somebody else. So they yeah. should be able to understand you. They should be able to willing to, you know, to clean this shit up, to speak truthfully to yourself. Yeah, this is now becomes really hard. But do you think there are people who are happy in their lives, but with their lies in their lives? 
are the people happy being ignorant? It's, <laughs> you know, it, it's really the, you know, are there people, I think, I don't know if they're happy, but uh, I don't know if they're happy, truly happy. You know, they, they might be, it, it just might be all that they know, right? But mm. I don't know if they're truly fulfilled and feel truly alive. It just might be mm. what they're used to, right? right? And so, like right now, for those listening, I'm holding a pen. But if I'm holding this pen, now I've made a fist, and I'm holding this pen, and it's tight. And if, I, if I, I'm squeezing, making a fist, and I'm squeezing this pen so incredibly tightly it's hard it's it's painful it's painful it's painful it's painful but eventually if i keep doing this long enough it will start feeling normal it was all right. i know it's all i know it will start feeling normal mm. so am i really comfortable i don't know if i'm comfortable but it's all i know so it starts becoming comfortable so now you're talking about telling the truth you're talking about surrendering you're talking mm. about letting go it's like letting go should be mm easier but if this yeah. is all i've done and this is all i know am i happy or is it just all that i know you know and i yeah. think that because we've been conditioned um many times we're, we're actually afraid of the truth because we're afraid of the consequence but we don't realize that in certain ways what you don't deal with will deal with you and many times hmm. you, we carry, there is a cost in not acknowledging the truth. And sometimes that cost is, well, why is 65% of America on antidepressants? Okay. It's just people are, are afraid of change. That's why they are afraid yes, of we're accepting afraid of, the truth. So are we really happy? Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy, Vlad. But 65% of America is on antidepressants. <laughs> Yep. Something doesn't right. add up, right? So, so we right. found ways to cope with our pain, to numb our pain, to anesthetize our pain so that we don't, we, we drink it away, smoke it away, drug it away, sex it away, porn it away, social media it away, mm. shop it away, so that we don't have to kind of, we, we, we could take the edge off so that we don't have to feel right. the pain. And so what I invite people is to mm. tell yourself the truth, feel it burn in it because if you really burn in it and don't anesthetize in it right you burn in it it will start a process inside it will slowly begin a movement inside to me that's that's how wow. it, that's how it works wow well this has been an incredible conversation Kut, thank you so much i mean it's, it's it's really been such a pleasure and a very insightful conversation I know we started off with our kids and talking about, uh, you know, unconditional love. Yeah. And, 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 and I wanted to add a great visual, by the way, with the pen, I, I, I that, that it, it has a really hard impact when you actually show that, which, which, which really makes sense. Uh, could, I know you wanted to also mention something to our audience, sure. uh, please feel free to share anything that you would like with them. Yes. No, it's been a fun interview guys. I really, I really appreciate the space you've held and some of the great questions from both of you. Um, yeah, I would just say if you've if you've been inspired by the conversation, check out my book, The Magic of Surrender, the paperback available on on Amazon. The second thing is, um, this is a special invitation. If you're someone you listen to this conversation and perhaps you you feel that you've been put on the planet for a purpose bigger than yourself, and you feel you feel a readiness, like you feel like, yeah, I'm ready to heal and transform and unravel my conditioning and connect to my power and share my gifts with the world. Uh, twice a year, I do a very special event called Game Changers for leaders, for those that want to impact humanity in some way. I've done this event for 13 years. 2024 is my last year doing this event, actually. And so wow. it's called Boundless Bliss, the Bali Breakthrough Experience. It's 12 days with me in Bali. It is a profound, life-changing process. I call it a, a, a seminar training without walls where I take you for 12 days. I take you through a process of unraveling the layers of your conditioning in such a deep and profound and healing way. And so if, if you feel ready 
for that next level of breakthrough, you can join me. You can find out more. The next event is July the 20th through the 31st. Uh, www.boundlessblissbali.com. That's boundlessblissbali.com. Find out more there. Watch the video. You can apply for an interview. Uh, those that want to connect, find me on Instagram, Coot Blackson. Facebook, Coot Love Now. My podcast, Soul Talk. Thank you so much. And of course, we will have all of those links readily available. You can find that on the description or as a hyperlink. Uh, Kuth, thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, we look forward to staying in touch. Thanks a lot. And we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.